the odds that she'll press the wrong one. Is, is it safe recording? It's, yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Up the left. Well, I see a little camera looking thing. Does that mean it's doing something? Yeah, that's recording. That's recording. That's I don't like ideograms or whatever they are. Give me a good word. Well, uh, I'm going to start. Uh, thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, hope you everybody's enjoying the nice, cool, crisp weather we're finally getting here. Um, I have some business stuff to take care of, Silu, and then our uh, speaker tonight will be uh, uh, Ken G. Okay. Um, for those that, that haven't been following what's going on, uh, the New Jersey natural gas uh, application was denied by the zoning board. Uh, Silu and lots of other people in the community worked together uh, to get out um, the information of what was going on. I think typical to uh, that effort was the work that we did with the lawn signs that were out about in the community, the articles that were in the press, uh, the multiple flyer distributions that went out to uh, the community. I'd like to thank everybody who helped and everybody who helped distribute the flyers house to house. Um, it is a strategy that uh, we've been working on going forward because uh, we expect uh, New Jersey Natural Gas to appeal um, basically uh, we'll probably try to work harder this time to set up a community uh, group that will focus on the single F effort. Uh, also, we'll have to start doing some fundraising because it'll probably mean that we'll need to hide some um, expert help in the forms of lawyers and subject matter experts to help uh, represent the community. Um, there are the latest, uh, the latest uh, Issue in our town is the announcement of a land swap, um, 100 plus acres over at Cross Farm, for about 16 acres across from um, from the high school and SATS. Um, uh, I think if anybody, if, if you, you don't know what 100 acres look like, the Cross Farm where the fields are right now, that's over 100 acres right there. Okay, so they're talking about the property that is south of uh, Willbrook Road. Uh, there's lots of questions there, um, typical of our community. Uh, we're told about things almost like it's faded complete, um, but there's a lot of hurdles I suspect I'll have to go through uh, with the county uh, to make this happen. Uh, Preserve Homedale is focusing on this effort, um, so is so is uh, CELO is focusing on this to figure out what the details are. Um, I suppose even what event might have an opinion on this. Um, but personally, I, I, I think that if, if the town is going to build some type of recreational facility, uh, the location is probably ideal. The question is the details, of course, we don't have any yet. Um, from CELU, uh, both RJ and Regina will be following this issue. Um, we'll give you some calendars, things. Uh, New Year's Day, correct me, Ralph, if I'm that is correct, or I don't know if I'm wrong. For the host, January 1 is, new, is the New Year's Day hike, starting at 10.30, over by um, uh, Roberts Road, across from the Arboretum. But we also have one on December 8th. Oh. December 8th is the one that's going to start from the high school doing the new um, trail that's on the F&F &F property. Yes. Okay? Uh, and that starts at what time? Yeah. At 10 o'clock. Okay? Um, Looking a little bit further down the road, our potluck dinner uh, and our annual elections will be in March and April. Uh, you can mark your calendar for Earth Day, which is April 28th. Uh, our barbecue will be in September, probably around the 14th. Um, that day, I can't give you until we can get confirmed from the, from the township. Um, and our candidate forum is going to be on Monday, October 20, 21st, here at 7.30. So uh, if you see any of our township committee, talk to them, see if they will be showing up uh, at, the, uh, at, at the Kennedy Forum. As usual, we, have, as usual, we, we really appreciate uh, everybody who was running for the board event. I think that's great. Uh, on a side note, okay, the YouTube video that we record on this uh, has a, a three to one hit ratio between the people that view the board event versus the township committee, and that number is almost over 500. It's over just maybe a little over a month now. Barely. So uh, the committee really is interested in 
in hearing what the people on the board of ed have to say. Uh, my own question is whether this is enough time and whether we should expand that to give them more opportunities to say more about uh, what they're doing on the board of ed and what they plan to do. But that's just a thought. But right now, it seems to be working. Um, we were uh, supposed to have a special speaker tonight. I got contacted by uh, Mike Nichols, uh, who said he wanted to come speak to us tonight. I also got contacted this evening by Mike saying that he couldn't make because of train issues and some personal issues with his son and his Eagle project. Um, so I, we don't have uh, that special speaker. Um, I also was hoping that Mike was going to talk to us about Palmer Avenue and Rutgers study possibly give us an update on what's going on with the forest study. Uh, but we do have Ken G from charge and I'm going to turn the mic all over to him. I'm the fallback, is that what it is? <laughs> no, you're not the fallback. Thanks, Baker. No, we asked you first. I'm going to kill you. I know. Um, is that okay? With yeah. lunch? Can everybody see this? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you want to hear me? No. Um, if I could add, uh, Scott, I think you uh, gave a list of number of items, but uh, just from watching recently, I would urge all of you to pay attention to beyond the list of things that Scott mentioned is uh, coma. Um, in particular, as you know, the town has been in litigation and there's a number of properties um, that are being considered. Uh, and the density of those things are going to be incredible, so you, you need to keep an eye out on it. It's huge beyond, forget the, um, you know, before the election there were some allegations of certain conflicts of interest, but let's set that aside because that may or may not be politics as some people call it, but there's some real issue um, with respect to color because of the density and implication to the Board of Ed, to number of student enrollments because there's potentially as many as 600 units that could be added. And depending on how many kids you ascribe to a per unit basis, when you look at a whole bunch of stuff, um, based on a set of reasonable assumptions, there could be a potential impact as much as $6 million a year to the school budget because of that and so on. So, you know, that number can move around, but the point is that it's not a small number, there's some implications, there's a density, the look and the feel of the township. Now, I'm not running for election or anything like that, so this is totally non-political and it's only um, for the best interest of Palmdale. So, you know, in terms of informed land use, that's something that I think you folks need to keep an eye on. And that's, a, that's an issue, that's a train that has left the station and it's moving because there's a court hearing now that's been rescheduled in February 2019. And my understanding um, is that a lot of the plans for that is subject to approval by the governing body in the next two months in order to be ready for that public hearing before the judge uh, caught him, sorry, not public hearing. So anyway, with that, let me turn to you something that's a little bit uh, closer to, uh, to my heart here. I'm just going to speak very briefly about the agenda, tell you who I charged about, what we learned the last couple of years, uh, talk a little bit specific about two cases, and then talk about the current petition that JCPNL has filed, and what we think about that. So some of you may know that I was with Rage before this, and obviously it was David versus Goliath when we won. And so despite that, I formed charge. And people think either I'm glutton for punishment, which I probably is true, or I'm Don Quixote. I don't know which one, but um, anyway, you know, in the last couple of years we learned that um, there is a crying need for a consumer advocate uh, to represent individual consumers, and so. Rage was done and over, but that was a one-off transmission project. That was a very specific project. We saw needs beyond that, and so charge was formed because of that. And we expect to be involved in a number of issues, but most of them safety, rates, health, and so on, all of which are involved in the uh, utility and energy sector. So before I begin, I just want to some, clear up some very basic uh, misunderstandings sometimes, because at the Rage won its case. Uh, there been a number of power outages in the town. Middletown, Homedale, has and elsewhere. And guess what? On Facebook, you start to see posts up there that say, well, you know, maybe those guys from Ray should oppose the monster power lines. Well, <clears throat> one has absolutely nothing to do with the other. Okay? So this is a business model for the electrical grid system that's been 
over the last 30, 40 years. It's the same business model that JCPNL and its corporate parent, First Energy, continue to use. Power is typically generated at some four places. And in the case of JCPNL, it's over in Ohio, mostly. The power plants out there. After the power is generated, it gets transmitted to high power transmission lines. Just think of it as the New Jersey Turnpike Interstate for Energy, for Electricity. It's high power because it's typically 230,000 volts, 500,000 volts, and so on. It gets transmitted over long distances until it gets to where the power is used. So in our case, in Homedale. That power is stepped down and it's kind of distributed locally. And so that whole green area that you see, this is what's known as the distribution system. 99% of all the power outages comes from problems here. But what you hear a lot about is investment in transmission lines, so RAGE and MCRPs and transmission lines. That has nothing to do with the power outages occurring in the distribution system. That's very important to note. I also want to clear up some misnomers. The, the term that's given to utility companies, public utilities, the reason it was done is because they're normally a brand of franchise to operate as a monopoly in the territory and supposedly with public interest. That's where the term public utilities come from. However, with some exceptions, almost all utility companies are private for-profit companies with shareholders. I say private, a lot of them are public traded, but again, they're a for-profit company as opposed to a government agency. So even though you hear the term public utility, they're really for-profit companies. And I'll go through some of the cases, but there's ample evidence that at least one utility company, in this case JCPNL, but there are other examples uh, elsewhere as well, that they actually have more the benefit of the shareholders and bonuses of management at heart rather than public interest. And here's the real kicker. If you go to a restaurant, you don't like the food, you don't like the service, well, guess what? You don't have to go back, right? You go to another restaurant and another one. Go to some Chinese restaurant, Italian restaurant, you've got different choices. With the utility company, you cannot switch. You're held captive. Now, you can decide where you buy the power, but the local company that serves you, the, the local company that has the distribution line in place, you're stuck with them. We're in JCPNL territory, and you got your choice of JCPNL or JCPNL. So with that kind of background, this comes from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, so the official U.S. government agency. I highlighted in the red down there, New Jersey average electricity prices are typically among the 10 highest of 50 states. This is just last year on their website. Now JCPNL will probably tell you that we got the lowest rate in New Jersey. They actually have said that at the meeting that the township has sponsored. Well, that reminds me of a story that my grandfather used to tell me. And I was really impressed with this. He said he ranked number three in his class. I was pretty impressed until one day I asked him how many were in his class. There were three in his class. So, JCPNL does have the lower rates if you compare to PSENG and so on. But overall, when you look at our rates when we compare to other states, we're among the top ten. I won't go through a lot of this thing, but some of you may remember in 2003 there was a blackout that occurred all through from Ohio to Mid-Atlantic and all the way up to Canada. And because of that, Congress passed an Energy Policy Act in 2005 that basically directed the federal government agency that oversees the energy sector to have incentive to build more transmission lines. Now critics of this called FERC candy. FERC is the uh, um, Federal Energy Regulatory uh, uh, Commission. So because of that, a lot, bunch of hope incentives, and I won't go through it, but one in particular is higher rates for transmission projects. And because of that, utility companies keep want to build transmission projects. Remember, that's the middle box there, that's a highway of energy. So I know we're in um, JCPNL territory. PSENG is the largest utility company in New Jersey. And since 2010, it's a relatively short period, eight years, 
they raised their transmission rates on a cumulative basis by 400% in eight years. I can tell you the rate of inflation is nowhere near that. Now, JCPNL and its corporate parent, First Energy, is sort of a PSE and G wannabe. They want to do this, but they haven't quite got geared up as fast as PSE and G. But I picked up a whole bunch of anecdotal stories that you can read about, in particular, you see this. This was at an analyst conference where the CFO of First Energy had said on record, they've identified $15 billion of reliability enhancement. Almost all of them are transmission projects. And they call that as a significant source of significant growth in earnings and beyond. So this is what they're trying to do. Build transmission projects. Now separately, one of the things that were alluded to if those of you who attended the meeting with JCPN now at the township meeting here, we actually have two reliability indices. There's actually three that the industry follows, but the New Jersey BP only gets data for two of them. But here's the interesting part. I won't go into the technical details of those two calculations, but there are two. It's the fact that these indices are not displayed or found on the BPU website. You can't find them. You would think consumers would be interested. You would think as the oversight and the regulators of the industry that would publish this, but nowhere are these found. However, if you dig into sort of the official records and so on, this was in a, um, a rate case on JCPNL. And the Division of Rate Council had to file um, a legal brief. And in it, one of their consultants simply said, based on the 2000, and I truly, for those of you who know, is a uh, electrical engineering uh, industry um, association that has all the electrical experts and so on. They had a survey, which is done annually, that JCPNL, Pennsylvania Electric, which is a subsidiary also of First Energy, and West Penn are generally in the third or fourth quartile, which is poor reliability performance as compared to other utilities in the U.S. Similarly, here's another statement where it says, he contends that First Energy's reliability is poor when compared to the other ones, and JCPNL at best a medium performing utility and it's generally among the worst performing, particularly in the northern area. Now, for those who don't know, JCPA actually had two territories. We're in what they call the Central Territory, and there's a Northern Territory, Morris, and so on, up in that area. So, remember the local distribution system. This is the source for 99% of the time with power outages and so on. And most of you know, we had um, Hurricane Irene, we had Superstorm Sandy, and earlier this year, we had Quinn and Riley. And typically, power outages. And there's always kind of uproar, and then BPU always conducts an investigation. The governor, in this case, jumped on the bandwagon pretty early. And they have all these uproars and hearings and all that. But despite all this, in the last 10 years or so, there's been no increase in, in terms of improvement, the preparedness, and the response. One of the reasons is that I went through the history of the fur candies and all that because the utility company have been pursuing these transmission projects because they get a much higher return. Even though they know that the local distribution system is where the problems are, they continue to neglect them. Now, yeah, I had a meeting with the energy advisor to Governor Murphy's office and I added this slide just for her benefit. Even though it's not as visible as clean air issues and uh, noise problems and so on, all these power interruptions is, uh, has power, uh, public, public policy implications. And it's a concern for, I think, for a lot of people, and it should be. So one of the things is, you know, loss of productivity that hurts the economy. It's been estimated $59 billion. In addition, beyond the inconvenience of losing power, it is a kind of safety, security, and health issue. I think you guys have seen some of the cases where people power lost power, and if you have medical equipment and so on, it's got major implications, and at least one woman had died recently in the storm. So let me turn to two specific cases, because a lot of that is generalities, but in May of this year, 
A new clay subsidy bill was signed into law. Now, um, New Jersey actually had three nuclear plants. They're all down south near the Atlantic um, shore there. They all happen to be in Senate President Sweeney's district. Pure coincidence. But during the lame duck period in December of last year, Senate President Sweeney tried to ram through his nuclear subsidy bill. But there was a big uproar. I went to a um, couple of the hearings, um, the Senate hearings on this thing. You can believe the room, the size, got all filled with people objecting to this thing. There's only one party that was really in favor, PSE and G. Why? They will get paid almost a billion dollars over a three year period in nuclear subsidy. And because they threatened to shut down their nuclear plants unless they get the subsidy. Despite that, there was no public disclosure of why they needed the subsidy. No public disclosure at all. And for the first time, oops, sorry. For the first time, the New Jersey Division of Rate Council actually will not be at the table um, to look at this. Oops, sorry. For those of you who don't know, um, Rate Council was a remnant of what used to be the Public Advocate Office. That was a government agency. Those of you who don't remember, um, they would fight for uh, better uh, access to the beach and a bunch of other things. They would sue other government departments, but they did the job too well. So in the first six months of uh, Governor Christie's first administration, they disbanded public advocate, but they kept rate council, much smaller budget, a lot less staff, but they are essentially the consumer watchdog and they automatically become an intervener in every utility case. However, this was written, the law was written where rate council would not be automatically, they had to file right, the rest of us to be a uh, intervener in any case, and in particular in this case. Even though the subsidy is being paid to PSCNG, all customers, the way the law is written, all customers, including JCPNL, so you and I will be paying this subsidy to PSCNG. So, as recent as three weeks ago, these are consultants that work for um, certain firms. PJM, in case you don't know, JCPN is part of a, um, a regional transmission organization, and that's called PJM. It's the largest in this country, it covers 13 states. Within PJM, there is a sort of independent arm of it, it's called Monitoring Analytics. So the president of that made a statement PSENG units are economic, meaning they're profitable. And expect to be economic in the foreseeable future based on market data. Similarly, there's another group called PJM providers. So these would be other energy providers to PJM. They hire a consultant who said, based on publicly available data and reasonable assumptions, New Jersey nuclear units, in particular PSENG, are highly profitable to 2023 and faces no imminent threat of retirement. This is three weeks ago. So despite all that, PSCNG is going to get a billion dollars over a three year period. You and I are paying for it. Now turn our attention to JCPNL. Typically, utility companies file what they call a rate case every two or three years. Could be four years sometimes, but typically in that kind of time frame. In 2005, JCPNL had a base rate filing that was approved and then did not submit another rate case for another six years. Rate Council said, time out, we have evidence because they filed all the financials and so on, that JCPNL has over earned. Now rates that you and I pay are supposed to be what they call just and reasonable. So there's a whole formula and a whole bunch of things to But basically, rate council, they over earn. They file a petition asking BPU to require JCPNL to file a rate case. Of course, JCPNL opposed, and they lost. And so in 2012, they were required to file a base rate case. So now, seven years after the 2005 rate case. This was in the legal brief in that rate case. They basically, BPU gave extra money to JCPNL in that 2005 case to improve reliability. 
But as discussed below, so this is an illegal brief. After making an initial repair, it is unclear whether the company continued to use the funds collected for reliability improvement. Instead, it appears that excess funds went to shareholder dividends. Remember, JCPNL is a private company owned by First Energy, publicly traded. JCPNL's poor performance continues to this day. So that's on the official record. By the time that case was settled, it was 2015 now. JCPNL was found to have over-earned by more than $100 million per year and was ordered to reduce their rates. The number is actually 115. Sorry, I'm an actuary by trade and I have to be more precise. So what does that mean? From the five-year period when Rate Council filed a petition to require JCPNL to submit a rate case, their time was determined. They made over $100 million each year. So on a cumulative basis, they made over $500 million in extra profit. However, Rate Council actually recommended, based on their analysis, a rate reduction of $200 million. So that number is to be uh, believed. It's a billion dollars over a five year period. 200 million times five. JCP now have about a million customers. So that means on the average, the average customer overpaid by more than $1,000. So each of us, I'm sorry? $1,000 cumulative, it's not per year. Correct, I'm sorry. It's a thousand cumulative because I'm uh, based off the billion dollars cumulative. Thank you. So how did this happen? Well, after they got the rate approved in 2005, there was no incentive to continue pr uh, proper maintenance. Very basic accounting. For businesses and whatever, right? You got revenue, you got expenses. Revenue minus expenses is profit. Very simplified, okay? For utility companies, revenue is regulated. So the rates is approved by the BPU. So there's some seasonality to it, how hot it gets and all that, but basically that's kind of locked in. There's not a lot of control that the utility companies have for it. However, expenses, operating and maintenance expenses in particular, all within their control. They have 100% control of that. So the more expenses they can reduce and cut, revenue minus expenses, guess what? The profit increase. Keep that in mind. This is a practice that uh, Jay's not here, but Jay, as a former utility analyst, will tell you that this is actually a practice that's known in the financial industry in terms of analysts that cover utility companies. They call that pump and cut. You pump up the rates for rate filing, and then you cut it after that. So JCP and I would have been happy to continue that, except rate council would step in and say, uh-uh, time out, you gotta file. So, what are the consequences? There's no disincentive for fines. Up until recently, utility companies only fine a hundred dollars per day for any wrongdoing. A hundred dollars per day. So if you got a hundred million or maybe two hundred million dollar estate, you know, even if you are fine, it's kind of dropping the bucket. The rate reduction that was ordered by BPU is what we call prospective, forward only. It's not retrospective back when it was found to have been over-earned. There is no clawback or refund. So whatever over-earning that JCPNL had, they get to keep it, all at our expense. I'll come back and talk a little more about that. But about a year after this, 2016, JCPNL came right back and asked for a rate increase. They asked actually for 142 million, and they got 80 million. I'll come back to that. So the current petition that JCPNL filed is called Reliability Plus. They filed this in July, it's for four year, $387 million quote, investments. When you actually read through the petition, you read through a lot of stuff, most of the so-called investments are what I would consider normal maintenance and upgrades that are expected to perform. Out of 387 million, 108 tree trimming. And they try to make it fancy, vegetation management, ash trees and whatever, but it's tree trimming. 
and they are required once every four years to go to their territory to make sure trees are trimmed properly and so on. $20 million for re, uh, replacing lateral fuses, $37 million for substation replacement, and interestingly, $9 million investment for new fences. Why? Because they got stuff stolen. Copper is expensive, so they want new fences. And that's part of this reliability plus. Now, if you and I have a broken fence, we got people breaking in, well, guess what? We got to pay for our own expense of replacing the fence. So what's new about the proposal? This is being um, asked for approval outside of the normal base rate filing. And they're seeking approval for something called accelerated cost recovery, which means they can file for a rate increase as frequently as six months over the next four years. And on top of that, the last point here, they will not be required to submit a normal rate file until 2024. That means it will be seven full years from the time the 2016 filing, which is the last one that was approved in December, to the next filing. Now, most of you know I'm a Homedale resident. I've been involved with rage and charge. And this is not political, but I have to say this. I see newsletters, I see communication from our township that said they look forward to this getting approved. Not once did they ask any citizen group or rage, charge anyone or what they thought about this. Let me explain, given this background. In December, when they got that 80 mil member, 10 years passed when JCPNL did not do any rate filing and then they finally was ordered to reduce their rates by more than $100 million. 10 years. A year after they were asked to reduce their rates, they came back and asked for a rate increase. One short year. And they got $80 million rate increase approved. And shortly after that, like within two days, they issued a press release. And they said the rate increase will be used for tree trimming. Inspection on lines, posts, substations, and mains, and newly installed equipment. However, in 2017, so the rate increase was approved in December 2016. In a short 12 months right after that, JCPNL was able to reduce their operating and maintenance expense by $96 million. One short year, right after that. So, Yogi Berra say deja vu all over again. If you look at what's being proposed there, routine maintenance, upkeep, and so on, there, yes, there are some that you would call automation upgrade and so on that is very different than maintenance, but the preponderance, more than half of the expenses, are what we call normal routine maintenance stuff. So the question we have to ask is, will we get paid twice, will customers have to pay twice for the same work they should be doing? So I know I kind of have a lot of information. This is a quick timeline. 2005, they got a rate increase, and they were allocated additional money to increase reliability. Six years, nothing. Rate council says, hey, you guys over-earned. You should file a rate case. They fought it and found an order. 2015, they were asked to reduce their rates by 100 million, 10 years. One year later, they came right back and asked and got 80 million dollar increase. And then the year after that, they reduced their expenses by 96 million. And now they just came back and asked for a four year, 387 million dollar petition. So, unfortunately, there is a public hearing and it's both tomorrow. One at 1.30 in Frio, one at 5.30 in Morris uh, County. Now, I don't know about you guys, 1.30. That's really not conducive to getting comments from the public because most people are at work. But I will be there and I hear a rope a few people. If you guys can make it, I know it's short notice, I encourage you all to go there. But if you can't, you can submit written comments, just make sure you get the docket number in there. You can submit to the secretary of the board and so on and I'm happy to maybe get to Scott or someone to have on the city's uh, website or something like that. So if you feel as I do, you know, I'd encourage you to submit written comments opposing this thing. So, in summary, our average electricity rate in New Jersey is among the 10 highest in the country. 
Despite that, most of you probably experienced outreaches in Seoul with poor reliability, services that present good early growth in Seoul. And uh, we have no ability to switch if we want to. I said, you know, I like PSUNG. Maybe I should go through that and not withstand any transmission. Well, you can't do that. Decisions for maintenance and investment rest with the electric distribution, uh, you know, all rest with utility companies. Again, the private companies, the decision is to benefit the shareholders. Even though there is oversight, but BPU cannot direct them to do certain things. So, at least one utility company has shown has put us our self-interest first, and the system is broken and needs to be fixed. Hence charge. Hopefully I'm not done the windmill chaser. So with that, uh, we do have a website, newjerseycharge.org. We actually have a Facebook. It's a long name, because charge stands for Consumers Helping Affect Regulation of Gas and Electric. You know, we raise, uh, we like acronyms that make sense, so charge is all that too. So uh, open up for any questions anyone has. Regina. So uh, the question is, why did BPU, you know, after the 10 years that BPU ordered them to reduce their rates by $100 million, why did a year later they approve an $80 million increase? Well, was the rate council that forced them, and then the BPU? No, the, the rate council was basically uh, our watch on this. Is JCPNL is making too much money. So they stepped in, they required the file. So that has nothing to do with that. No, okay, so, so there are two separate rate cases. The one is over, the rates were reduced. Then a year later, they came back and asked for the increase and it was granted. So your question is why, right? The reason is, you remember I went back to a slide that says something called pump and cut. So what JCPL did, as soon as that rate cut was uh, ordered by the BPU, they pump up their operating maintenance expense. And then they wait 12 months and they show how high their expenses are. And then that led to, well, we need a rate increase because of these expenses. But as soon as they got the $80 million, then they cut their expenses that they pumped up by $96 million. Again, it's an industry practice that um, analysts and other people know. So what happens during the 2016 rate case, they submit evidence their expenses are high, which they were. Which they, um, consciously spend that money okay, to the company. Okay, but doesn't look, look back past the one year ever. They never look at the history. They, well, no, they know the history. Um, but on you doing a, a base rate case, you got to look at that particular period. So this is always looking forward. So what they have was evidence of a higher operating expenses. What they know but couldn't do anything about was that there's a practice where once they pump it up, they bring it back down. And then until you they are forced to file another rate case. You can't reduce the rate until such time. Ralph? Uh, just to understand a little bit the politics, the BPU is part of what the part division of the state government and who appoints the members of the um, The government, they're, they're relatively independent, but it is a government agency. They, um, there's a board of five commissioners which are appointed for a term of six years. And the governor, whoever the governor is, appoints um, the commissioner. So in fact, uh, Governor Murphy appointed Bob Bowen, who used this state senator, when uh, the past president, uh, Richard Morose, um, stepped down. He was a Republican and stepped down, and then there was an opening, and uh, Bob Murphy appointed the uh, state uh, senator, Bob Bowen, to be on it. And how does the great council office fit with this, and how is it? Uh, rate council is also appointed by the governor as part of the um, cabinet, um, well, the whole cabinet organization. It's a, it's a very strange thing. Their budget, I believe, is part of Treasury, but the um, director, who is Stephanie Brand, who is fantastic, is appointed by um, Governor Murphy. So effectively, they're all governor appointed. Uh, yes, but remember the BPU, the commissioners, once they're appointed, they serve on a six-year term. So that could, yeah. Question? I can't be that good. I can't answer all your questions, right? The 96 million, um, did that 
that happen as a result of having to I'm sorry? expenses with the 96 million that their expenses were reduced? Mm -hmm. How did that come about? Well, um, if you don't spend the money on tree trimming, you don't spend the, you know, you can control your expense in a number of different ways. Um, and some of what they do is they just don't make certain improvement. They, they, um, JCP now, when we got them on the stands for the court hearing um, for um, uh, MCRP, they, they, they actually don't uh, budget for replacement. Normal businesses would say, we, we expect certain things that they budget certain dollars for replacement, so they go, ah, we don't do that. When things die, when things are broken, then we replace it on an as-needed basis. And so, you know, if you get lucky on a particular year or nothing gets broken or whatever, they don't replace it. We also have evidence that, for example, there were at least um, 11 circuits, uh, electrical circuits, that really should be replaced because uh, certain ratings, I won't get too technical, but, but they are kind of below the standard for new circuits that, that are put in place. And they should be replaced. They don't do it. So if you don't do it, you don't spend the money, you, you cut expenses and stuff like that. So, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. You can cut expenses when you already want. What the long-term effect is a different issue, but you can cut expenses in the short term. Just stay good. Francine. Yeah. If, if all of this is so publicly known, the games they play, I question how effective is the BPU? Are we wasting our tax money on another government organization that has no power? Um, the question is, uh, we bang our head on the wall, I guess. Is the BPU that effective? I refuse to comment on, on that on the grounds they may incriminate you. <laughs> <laughs> I think your, your electricity will be shut off. Yeah. No, um, the, 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 BPU, um, the BPU and the staff, does this, it, it's a really tough job they've got, i got to tell you guys. Um, it's not just electricity. There's gas, there's water. Um, you know, utilities is very broad. and. Um, they do have a very tough job, and it gets very technical sometimes. Um, I try to put it in a way that people can understand, but i got to be honest with you, it took me two years to get to my point of trying to understand a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and this is simplifying a lot of stuff that I already have. So uh, it's not as easy as you think. I mean, some of the JCP and Nell's MCRP petition was 682 pages. This one was 400 some pages. Just to read through that, I mean, because I believe in osmosis, put under my pillow, it works every time, you know. But it's not as easy as you think. And, um, you know, they got lawyers, they make their own arguments, and, and they throw, you know, it's amazing to me. When I hear the arguments, you know, on the terms of reliability, robustness, resiliency, they throw all these things, and people get scared. They, they don't know, you know, some of the, but when you really, you know, dig them into it and try to understand it, it makes a lot of sense. But, um, you know, as I said, I'm not, hopefully, I'm not glutton for punishment. I do think that these kind of things needed to be um, more people like you sitting here learning about this. Up until now, I mean, how many of you really kind of understand this? I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't understand this up, you know, up until now. In the last two years, it kind of really opened up my eyes to spend the time. I and mean, I can't tell you, my wife thinks I'm nuts, you know, today. She, you know, the OCD, the term, you know, like there are two personalities, type A and type B. She called me triple A, you know, because. <laughs> I was so obsessed with this thing and learning everything I can, and I, I won't tell you how many trees I kill from just uh, printing all this stuff just to learn as much as I can. It's not as easy as you think, but I'm hoping that through a small group of us, we take all this knowledge, share with people, and hopefully get enough people to say, you know, we support you guys. Will you be also, will Charge be also involved with any machinations with water and gas? Uh, at some point, but um, there's you know limited number of people and there's limited number of hours. So the short answer here yeah, is absolutely what we see in the electric um, side applies to it. You know, with water, one of the things I'm sure some of you may have noticed that um, there's been a practice by water companies. You see your bill going up recently. Um, they, there's a provisional rate thing that they are allowed to charge something, so they could file for a rate increase. And the BPU doesn't approve it and, uh, in certain time frame, they can actually jack up your rates on under what's called provisional basis. And then they can come back and give you back it, your money. But meanwhile, they basically got millions of dollars of free loan. And that's what they've been doing. And you eventually get your money back. I'm not sure about the interest adjustment for it, but basically got free loan from all of us. So there are a bunch of other issues. But anyway, Barbara.
where it will be put. They're going to put it where they get, as they say, the most bang for their buck, so where there's the most residents. We don't know how much of this, they did say certain areas of Homedale will get the improvements. We don't know if you're- No, we do know, we do oh, know. If you, it's 280 some pages, and in there is an exhibit, and yours truly did go through it. And depending on which, you know, so remember they have um, four broad categories of investment. But on some of the replacement of lateral fuses, which is the recloser, that, that's really important. That should be something we want them to do. Right. Just not under this particular program. Homedale got less than 1% of the investments. There's a whole exhibit, and my eyes just got uh, crazy, but I, I went to each of the exhibits and highlighted which one was for Homedale, which one for Middletown, Hazard, and so on. You divide by the total, less than 1% goes to home now. So yeah, so that information. Yeah, that's another I mean, important point is we wind up paying for home that. Del, home Dell will well. benefit, but not to like a great extent. Now, I mean, there's nothing targeted for them. Remember, this is for all of JCPNL's territory. So there's 1.1 million customers, not just home now. Now, they came to home now partially because we made a lot of noise partially because they're over at the works and, and so on, but this is nothing special about for whom they in particular. So. Parents. Are you seeking any uh, resolutions uh, in opposition from any municipalities? Have you shared this information? This well, other as I mentioned, the municipality actually support this. Though embarrassing, especially when I'm against it, and then there's my opinion, but um, no, uh, you know, we're opposing this. One of the things we thought about is to be a legal intervener. That's always an option. Um, for race, we did that. Uh, and I got to tell you, 2029, so I'm glad we did because we had the, the town with several other towns as part of some called Joint Municipal Group was also a legal intervener. But I sat in the court every day for the 10 day hearing. They didn't put up one witness. We put up, we mean Rage put up five witnesses. And in the um, judge um, initial decision, it was 180 pages, first extremely long. The judge gave special props to Rage, and it says Rage, kind of, I'm paraphrasing, carried the water uh, for that. If it wasn't for Rage, this thing should, you know. And, and anyway, uh, I don't have a lot of, um, most of the elected officials will support this because it, it should improve reliability. Um, and I personally do want them to do, JCP to do what they want. But they shouldn't be doing it outside of a normal rate case where essentially working as paid uh, probably at least twice for the same work that they should be doing. So um, to be a legal intervener, you require to hire a lawyer and take expenses. And I you know for Sulu, your annual fee is $20, which is not a lot. That will pay for three minutes of a good lawyer, at least the one that we use for rage. So um, we have it, but what we have is supported rate council. Uh, I reach out to other groups, and we will speak at the public hearing. Uh, BPU does take some of those public comments into hearing. I, I went for May and several other hearings, and they actually do listen to that. What question? I'm going to run for, no. My, my first comment is that the township doesn't answer, can you give it anyway? Number one. Number two, what's You know I'm not shy about that. Okay. That well, doesn't mean you're going to listen. Formally, in the newspaper, get up and read it at the township meeting because it's the record, things like that. Uh, the other thing is, what is what is your long term goal? It seems like going after JCP and L is a goal to do. We need to change the laws, I guess, at the state level. So should you be going more towards the, the governor, trying to get people to stay government? Yeah, it depends. The question is, what's, you know, um, what's the plan of action? And the short answer is everything and everywhere. Uh, I've been to the governor's office. I spoke with the energy uh, advisor. Um, but you need certain specific plans and certain things. I actually go in there, hoping that they can bring back the public advocate office at least in particular for the energy, because they can do the heavy lifting that we don't have to do. Um, I've met with uh, state senators, like Ben Oskan, Ben Gopal. Um, I'm trying to set up a meeting who's the um, chairwoman of the Economic Growth Committee, because a lot of the utility petitions and stuff like that goes through that. Um, 
and I was actually invited to submit comments on some of the utility laws that were being passed. Um, I was I provide testimony at one Senate uh, committee, and then the assembly side asked if I wanted to make comment. Unfortunately, I was in California, I couldn't do it. So the short answer: we're trying to make um, this fairly widespread and trying to get our message out. You guys only hear it for the first time because I I, mean, I do share this on charge web page, um, website, Facebook, stuff like that. But if you don't follow, you probably wouldn't know it. So, um, well, you could be Jay tonight. <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. Is that tomorrow? Uh, no, I got to give you the exact date. The public hearing is tomorrow. But typically they allow up to 30 days after the public hearing for written comments to be submitted. Okay, no more questions. No, no, you could be. Jay's not here tonight. You could be, you could be Jay. <laughs> Sorry. I'll tell Jay that. Just so. <laughs> Any other questions? I see it on the video. Oh. Uh, all right, thank you very much for your attention. I know it's not the most exciting time for the board. Um, I just want to change the subject slightly to New Jersey gas. Um, just tell you a personal experience. Um, I had my, uh, my uh, meter was making noise. And uh, so I we called the uh, New Jersey Natural Gas and I came out and changed my meter. And then a couple months later, I get back a uh, notice that I don't have to pay any gas now for the next year or two. Huh? My meter was over, they were overcharging me on gas. Okay, so uh, of course they didn't provide me any details whether the, I've been in my house for 20 years, did they only, did they go back seven or the five? I really don't know how long they went back, but. And how many other residents are Well, I'm just sharing you my experience and I would recommend you might want to call and tell them that uh, your meter is making noise and have your meter taken out and uh, um, let them, uh, uh, they, they test the meters to make sure how it's running. So that was my experience. Um, so I just wanted to pass that, uh, that on to everybody else. Yes, Ralph. With regard to that, I know just oh, probably about a month or so ago, New Jersey and America came by and replaced their water meters. And their letter telling us they needed to do so indicated they were required to replace the meters every 10 years. So that would potentially mean, you know, at worst, <laughs> your meter was running high for 10 years. But so it was gas, though, not water. Yeah, but I, I don't know that plot. The, the meter requirement replace it was for water. I'm guessing something similar may well also exist for electric and for gas. I don't know if that's true. Well, that's kind of interesting. I also had my water meter changed out, um, and I suspect the reason why they did it was because my water consumption was so low. Um, we become empty nesters, yeah. we're really conservative, and all of a sudden I get a notification that they have to change my water meter. Big deal. I did shut down the meter number and and what the numbers were, but they never, and I did we say, I'd like this tested, but they never got back to me, so I don't know whatever happened with that. Well, the other thing with the water meter, they changed the technology of the meter. And, uh, they took the cockroach out that measures? Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it was, the meter itself was in the basement, but then it had an external antenna on the side of the house. The new meter doesn't have an external antenna, but it's, it, the antenna is on the meter itself. It says it's got a different transmission scheme and it's easier for them to re read it, just um, going back and forth. So. so I'm not an expert on water meters. Mine's actually in my front lawn and they come by with a truck that's able to scan it from outside and the antenna is sitting right there on the outside. In the front this lawn. one, it's, it's in, it's in the basement. The, yeah. they, they just cut the wire off to the outside. Yeah. So it, it's got it. So I just remind everybody about the uh, December 8th uh, hike from uh, the parking lot across from the Arboretum. I'm sorry. December 8th is the hike of um, F, and F. F and F and meeting at the high school. Harvard. The high school parking lot in the Duncan Smith Theater. But on the Smith's Theater. Uh, um, what's really exciting about it, that's the latest new trail that, that we have built here in town uh, with the concern that I've heard from Phobos, 
Uh, I assume some Eagle Scouts, uh, Eagle, Scouts. Um, Eagle Scouts were out there uh, building it. I've, I've been a, um, still am a member of uh, Boy Scouts. Many of the trails here in, in our community have been built uh, with the Eagle Scouts doing Eagle projects. Um, it's a tremendous service they do and uh, we urge you to walk in. It's, it's, this one is probably the easiest one. It's about a half mile in total. So it's uh, an easy, looks pretty flat. Uh, walk. You get to see the inside of Reminiscent Brook. Um, you know all the controversy we talk about with turf field. Well, this stream runs up on either side of the of the Homedale High School and Sats, and then it further goes all the way up to um, a te Telegraph Hill. Telegraph Hill is the beginning of the, that's literally the beginning of the Reminiscent Brook the, uh, and the headwaters for our water supply. So. If you look at what the town has proposed a number of times, it's putting in synthetic turf right along the stream. And synthetic turf, if you, if you haven't been listening to what's going on, basically those are ground up uh, tires. Uh, tires are made with lead and other many hazardous chemicals. And uh, the EPA does not allow the tire industry to bury that or even dump that in the ocean. They had to come up with a way to dispose of this. So they came up with using this for synthetic turf. They came up with making these mats and putting them into playgrounds. Uh, the way I look at it is, I wouldn't want them to put toxic chemicals anywhere near my water supply. I don't think they should put it in, in ours or in our community. Yes, Ralph. Uh, to expand on that, would, and also- can, can everybody hear Ralph? Yeah. Also, with regard to the recent- stand up. Suggested land swap. Uh, with the county. The property that they hope to get, you stand on Crawford's Corner Road, say in front of the Sat School, and look straight ahead. South. South. Across the road, you see an open field. That's sort of the property in question. No, no, that is the property. The way it is. At the back of that field, you see a tree line. That is a stream which continues flowing south, goes under Roberts Road, and then merges into the Ramonesson, which goes to the reservoir. Oh. Yes. So the Ramonesson and its tributaries can be categorized as C1, which means it's got to be protected and has a 300 foot buffer requirement from the state. If I take a map of the property across the street from Sat School and subtract 300 feet, I'm not sure where they're drawing property lines, but the 14 acres does not correspond to any existing lot. You probably lose about half of it because you can't do anything in the wetlands. That property, the tree line is from the road is about 700 feet back. Chop off 300 feet, you've just chopped off three sevenths. So if the total is 14 acres, 